Today, I'm interviewing Karen Emmanuel Keener, who happens to be my favorite teenager, who is the uh, smartest and prettiest and certainly nicest uh, young lady in the Western Hemisphere. Um, not that I'm biased or anything, but this is my daughter. So, um, Karen, I wanted to interview you on your thoughts about racism and the current situation in the U.S. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'll be answering some questions, um, whatever you have. I'll try to answer the best that I can. Did you, do, you, do you have your poem with you? I have it on my phone. Yeah. We, we, uh, uh, Karen's prophetic side came out in this poem, and so she's going to, going to read that yeah. now. When the Israelites' blood, sweat, and tears cried out to you after 400 years of slavery, you raised up Moses and led them out of the hand of Pharaoh. When the blood, sweat, and tears of black slaves cried to you in anguish, you raised up an army to fight the war. When this country was torn by signs degrading and segregating a whole people, you raised up king and led marches. Today, a bl the blood of black men, sold by bullets poisoned with hate and malice, cry out to you in desperation, in, ex in exhaustion and in frustration. We have fought Abba, and we are weary. We have marched, we have protested, gotten leg legislative changes, yet the sickness is not healed. So God, in desperation, in frustration, in anger, we surrender. We surrender this fight to you and trust that the blood of innocence that screamed out in pain, you, you cried with us and for us. You tr we trust that you have not forgotten. Instead, you have been at work in this country. So Abba, will you raise up another one? whether it be a single person who will inspire us to keep fighting, who will remind us of hope, or it be a whole army of young and old, male and female from all races and nationalities, that will stand up and march once more, stand up and be brave, to speak the words of wisdom, truth, and enlightenment. Let this not just be a revolution, but a revival. But most of all, Abba, will you show us that just like you stood before Moses, the men fighting on the front lines and marched ahead of Martin Luther King, once more, you will stand before us, leading us into victory. Thanks. Thanks, Karen. Yeah. And Karen uh, helped organize and lead the, the local march. And so, do you want to say anything about marching? About marching? Um, I think before like, I did this march, I thought that marching could only like be led by, I guess, like the big people in our community. But this was just like people from our church. Um, I think if, if you feel like in your community it's needed, don't be afraid to stand up and be the, that person who, maybe you just get a few friends together and get the word out, but just make sure that it's peaceful. Make sure that um, in the process of it, that you have the right mindset and make sure that you let your, poli like your local police officers know. So that way that you are putting yourself in a safe space, but not only that, when you're marching, you make sure that you're putting out the right message. Yeah. So some people who criticize the marches, they say, well, you know, you are, why are you marching for Black Lives Matter? All lives matter. What would be your response? I think everybody knows that all lives matter. At least everybody should know that all lives matter. The problem isn't necessarily that all lives matter. The problem is that in this country right now, it's not treated as if like all lives matter. There's a specific life right now, a specific race that is not treat, being treated the same. So by that, we're not saying that it's not that not all lives matter. We're saying that right now, we need to focus on black lives mattering. Mm -hmm. We need attention on black lives. Mm -hmm. That's what yeah. I would say. Yeah. So people are kind of changing the subject when they say all lives matter. Yeah. I think you're definitely, um, I think like, let's say you hear somebody say that they're not saying that your life doesn't matter, nor are they saying that their life matters more than yours. They're just saying that right now, we need attention on this. And when you're saying that all lives matter, it's as if, um, like you said, it's as if you're taking away from that specific subject, like you're changing the subject, but not only that, it's as if you don't want it to be on that specific subject. Like for example, if mm -hmm. I met somebody and I was like, all that black lives matter. And they're like, but all lives matter. In that moment, I feel like they're not necessarily valuing black lives matter mm -hmm. because right now they don't understand the struggle of black lives matter. Yeah. Um, now, there are some other people who will say about the marches, well, you know, 
um, there are extremists there. You know, there are people who are um, wanting to uh, abolish police departments and just take over all the patrolling themselves or whatever. Um, does that represent everybody who says that Black Lives Matter? Absolutely not. I think the Black Lives Matter, just like every other uh, big movement, religion even, uh, has a certain people, like type of people who are extremists. And usually they're mm-hmm. the ones who, like the, whose voices are heard. It's mm-hmm. happened before, during the Civil Rights Act. There was, it was the same thing. There's mm-hmm. extreme, there's like people who are um, going to the extreme. And sadly, mm-hmm. they're the ones whose voices are heard because they usually do the dangerous things. They're usually the ones who, mm-hmm. I don't know, who are like mm-hmm. on the screen. Mm-hmm. But that does that definitely doesn't reflect like everybody, at least the people, like, like the people that we marched with here on Saturday, mm-hmm. most of them, if not all of them, probably don't agree with that. So. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's important for people not to dismiss what's being done in the name of, you know, I mean, news media, they're responsible to cover news, which is what's newsworthy, which is what's unusual. But that doesn't mean that's... Yeah, that doesn't mean that's the voice of everybody. Yeah. So <clears throat> did you witness... Um, well, first of all, where did you grow up? I grew up in Congo Brazzaville, which is a small country in, I guess it would be like Central Africa. Yep. And it's a Francophone country. Yep. So you're fluent in both French and English. Yes. Uh, More yeah. English now, sadly, but <laughs> yeah. yes. You came when you were 11. Yeah. So did you see racism or something comparable there? Absolutely. I mean, there's, first of all, there's tribalism, um, which if for if nobody knows what like um a lot of African countries are like, there's different tribes. And I, I witnessed more than many times, like actually it was very popular. Somebody would say something like, Hey, don't marry from that tribe, they're this. Mm-hmm. Oh, hey, are you friends with that girl? Did you know that she's from this tribe? We don't like them, they're this. So like everybody was labeled as something bad. Like everybody had kind of a bad connotation mm-hmm. or a strong connotation with their tribe. Mm-hmm. And there was definitely like Sadly, I did. I don't think I even realized it when I was there, but it was definitely kind of like a bad, overlying attitude towards each other. And but not even that. Um, colorism plays a big effect in mm-hmm. Congo. If you're if you're more fair skin, you're usually treated better. Um, but not just that. Like a lot of um, like we call them étrangers, but a lot of people from different countries, like Americans, mm-hmm. Europeans, whenever they come. What happens is they're treated better than the people who are even from there. So mm-hmm. if you go to a like a grocery store and you're in line, if there's a white person, they might even mm-hmm. let them come first because they're seen as rich, better in some way. And I think these are some of the effects of col- colonization that are still mm-hmm. kind of resilient. And sadly, yeah, there there is that that's a type of racism that's also mm-hmm. existent there. Mm-hmm. So now um, talk about some of the. Just some examples. We're not condemning people, but some examples of racial insensitivity you've you've uh, experienced here. I've definitely experienced the um, kind of the feeling of unless you've been called an N word or unless you've been, I guess, beaten, you haven't necessarily been racially like you have. Nobody's been racist to you. I think a lot of people don't understand that racism. Or even just like you said, ignorance is also effective to people. Mm. Like I've heard multiple times, some people that I know, like at school being like, oh, that girl, she's pretty for a black girl. What does that signify? Right. Or uh, whenever one of my friends started dating a black guy and we're at the lunch table. One and you, she announced, one of your white friends. Yeah, one yeah. of my white friends started dating a black guy. Mm. Um, and all of, the, all of my other friends were white at the table. Mm. And she came and she announced and one of my friends was like, you're dating a black guy? And her face kind of signified. And then she looked at me and she was like, oh, like, you can see she kind of caught herself. Mm-hmm. But I always, I always wonder, I always ask myself, what would have happened if I wasn't at that table? Like, would she have realized that what she said mm-hmm. was like insensitive? Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, stuff like that happens to me all the time. So it's mm-hmm. not necessarily somebody being like, personally being like, oh, you are lesser than because of, because of your race, like saying those direct words to me. But it's more of the ignorance um, I guess that people, they don't, most of the time, they don't think they're being racist. They think they're just expressing their opinions or their preference. But there's definitely a clear line between preference and uh, 
prejudice, I would say that. Yeah. I mean, the, the example you gave, she wasn't speaking for her own preference. She yeah. was speaking for somebody else. Somebody else's preference. Yeah. So, and, and of course, we do know that there are, I mean, this surfaces in more direct ways from, you know, using the N-word to, to violence. Yeah, and, absolutely. And so on. And even though uh, you, you actually, at, at your age right now, you spent more years in Africa than here, um, but you've been here long enough. What what do you know about the history of of uh, well, just some some examples of some some of the history of racism. Some of the history of racism. I mean, I will say that I wish the school system did teach us more because I honestly didn't learn as much about racism as I would have liked to until I took uh, AP US history my junior year of high school, mm. and that was just focusing on the kind of the economic mm. uh, like. Uh, stature of like racism mm. so i i guess i understand like very much how racism came to be like the mm. uh like the transfer of africans here and how many years they were like in slavery and stuff but i wish i knew more about the unheard voices of the civil rights movement mm. like i've done some research especially during this time but i wish a lot like in schools it was taught more about mm. hey this person like you don't know them but they did something very important mm -hmm during the civil rights movement, or even talking about like the massacres that nobody knows about. You know, yeah. like the many blacks that were killed for like no reason at all. Like, and mm -hmm. these are stories that nobody really knows. They're stories that I'm just learning to know. Um, so yeah, I wish I knew more about that. Yeah, the, the lynchings and the mm -hmm. Jim, Jim Crow, well, especially after reconstruction, just thousands of black yeah. men, especially men, lynched as a way of putting down the, the black voice. And, and it, especially like uh, the reconstruction period, I feel like yeah. nobody really talks about that. It's known as, okay, there was racism and then there was the abolishment of racism and then there was a civil rights movement. It's as if there was no nothing in between, yeah. which is not true. Like, there was so yeah. much that happened, like big milestones that happened yeah. during that time. So Yeah, they, there were more African-Americans in Congress yeah. during reconstruction than there were until you know recent decades. Yeah. Uh, but then, with all the lynchings and stuff, it got it got shut down. People weren't weren't able to vote, and uh, and the massacre in Tulsa. I think you were thinking yeah. of that one. Mm -hmm. I heard about that. One hundreds. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, anybody interested in African American women in the period immediately after Reconstruction? Uh, Mom wrote a yeah. dissertation on that. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, yeah. first of all, it's not published. Second, it's two volumes. And third, it's in French. So sorry for those of you who don't read French. Uh, Google but, Translate. Is yeah, Google. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you might be able to understand some things, but... Uh. Yeah, so... Um, well, it's been great to have you with me, Karen. And uh, you've answered very well, especially considering I asked you some surprise questions because my brain doesn't think sequentially all the time. That's fine. Uh, but, um, so thank you so much for, yeah, for sharing with no us. Problem. Great great to be with you. <laughs> All right, bye.